Hi, you're about to listen to episode 16 of the Edgar Rice Burroughs podcast. Our plan when we recorded this was to talk about the book we're discussing uh, in one episode, but it turned out we had quite a lot to say and we went on for quite a long time. So we are dividing this discussion into two parts, uh, with part two posting about a week after this first part. So this discussion will end a bit abruptly at the end because we were not planning on it being a two-parter. Uh, but I hope you enjoy what we have here, and we'll come back next week when part two uh, posts. Computer. There we go. Okay, welcome to the Edgar Rice Burroughs podcast, episode number 16. Uh, my name is Tim DeForest, and I am the author of several books on what I call pre-digital pop culture, uh, things like pulp magazines and old-time radio and such. And I am joined tonight by my two co-hosts. My name is Jess Terrell, and you would know me from the Facebook discussion group for the love of all things Edgar Rice Burroughs, where with Lilla Pop and a cast of some 4,000 members, we talk Edgar Rice Burroughs all the time. We'd love to have you join us for love of all things Edgar Rice Burroughs. And I'm Scott Stewart. I'm a freelance editor and writer and always look forward to spending this time with Jess and Tim on uh, discussing any ERB related material. And mm -hmm. uh, I think all of you will enjoy this particular discussion tonight. Now, tonight we're going to be delving into the Edgar Rice Burroughs new universe. Um, and this is something being, these are a series of books, comic books, and I believe short stories being put out by the Edgar Rice Burroughs Incorporated, um, you know, fully licensed by them and considered to be an official part of the Edgar Rice Burroughs canon. So uh, to, to say it another way, these are stories that quote unquote really happened to Tarzan. Um, so they are, they are an official part of the, of not just Tarzan, but um, uh, official part of all the aspects of the Edgar Rice Burroughs universe. Uh, we'll, we will be talking about uh, Tarzan, The Battle for Pellucidor by Win Scott Eckert, which was published just last year. And I believe is the second of the novels that have come out that are part of the new universe so far. Um, and the, as I said, these are considered officially to be a part of, uh, of, the, of the Burroughs continuity, a part of his universe. And Continuity is something that's considered, uh, you know, that's that's that that fans think about in different ways. There are fans who love a good strong continuity, and they love timelines, and they love where stories fit in with each other, um, and they love to see connections between the different stories in a universe. Um, and uh, uh, that is one way of a fan appreciating the work of a particular writer, like Burroughs. There are other fans who love Burroughs' work just as much but don't worry about continuity. They just take each story as, a, as an individual entity. And um, I know there has to be consistency in characterization and setting and all of that, but they don't worry about how these stories connect with each other. They don't worry about which story took place in what year, uh, what story took place right after that. They just enjoy them individually. And that is an equally valid way for a fan to, uh, to consider a, the, the work of, of a writer such as Burroughs. Um, no one fan is better than the other or worse than the other for the viewpoint they take on continuity. Um, there, you know, there are, fans, sadly, we've seen from like the Star Wars fandom, for instance, there are those who just get so emotionally involved in it that they become insulting to people who disagree with them. And fortunately, we don't see that in most uh, Burroughs forums, such as at, for the love of Edgar Rice Burroughs. People might disagree about whether or not a particular story is one of the best ones or not. But nobody, uh, you hardly ever, if ever, see people insulting each other or getting mad at each other. Um, and I hope that continues as the new universe stuff is released. Because there will be fans who read these and just say, this, this is wonderful. Yes, this is a part of the, uh, of the Edgar Rice Burroughs continuity. And there'll be other fans who may enjoy them as adventure stories, but in their minds do not see them as official part of the universe. And other fans who won't worry one way or the other. So, um, and all once again are legitimate ways of looking at it. Um, if I can just use another, another universe as an example, I am a huge fan of Star Trek, the next, the, the original series. Um, and um, 
in my mind, in my personal mind, regardless of what is official canon, Star Trek V and the episode Spock's Brain don't exist. They didn't really happen. They're just like stories somebody told at one point. So the real Captain Kirk and Spock and all did not have those adventures because I just think they're terrible stories. And in my mind, I've canceled them out, regardless of what the official continuity is. And every fan can do the same thing. Continuity can be a very personal thing for every individual fan. And that's always perfectly appropriate. That makes sense to you guys? I was kind of riffing that. It does to me. <laughs> it, it sounds good to me. May I make uh, some additional comments regarding the ERB universe? Mm -hmm. um, to provide a, a list of, um, and, and Tim touched on this, of, of ERB universe uh, stories that we have thus far. Well, first of all, there's the basic ERB, I say ERB, Edgar Rice Burroughs. I use that mm -hmm. synonymously and interchangeably with Burroughs. Uh, the original books, uh, seven of them, for Pluster, that is, at the Earth's core, Pluster, Tanner of Pluster, uh, that was first three, then Tarzan at the Earth's core was number four. That was a crossover book, which was unheard of mm -hmm. in those days when that book appeared in 1929. Uh, the fifth Pluster book is Back to the Stone Age. Number six is Land of Terror. Number seven is Savage Pluster. All fine stories. I recommend every one of them. In fact, we've discussed several of them in prior episodes of this podcast. Mm -hmm. Now, so far as building the canon, that is uh, wh whatever Burroughs uh, says in his books, uh, that's the original canon. That's the baseline, so to speak. And then expanding that canon, think of it as a second layer. Mm -hmm. uh, other books that have expanded that canon, and these are approved for ERB Universe, and that is Tarzan, the Valley of Gold, written by Fritz Leiber, mid-1960s. There was a movie by the same name. Tarzan and the Dark Heart of Time by Philip Jose Farmer. Uh, there are selected comics by American Mythology, which will be included in the ERB universe. There is talk, oh, also, I almost forgot this, the recent uh, Carson of Venus, Edge of All Worlds, written by Matt Betts, is an ERB universe story, mm -hmm. and it's, it's got the special logo on it. Most of these things have the special ERB universe logo on them. And then there are some rumors, nothing official yet, nothing announced, of, of two books by the late John Eric Holmes that maybe, maybe, he said, maybe added to the ERB universe. And one's entitled Mayhars of Pellucer, which was published as a paperback in the mid-1970s. And it's follow-up, The Red Axe of Pellucer, which has seen, uh, I suppose, uh, limited printing uh, and nothing uh, from a major publisher. So, oh, so yeah. that, that comprises the ERB universe. Uh, go ahead, I'm done. Uh, I was just going to say, I really hope they do approve the Holmes books because I've always wanted to read them and they are almost impossible to find. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've never had the opportunity to do so. So, mm -hmm. Well, I, I distinctly recall when I found it as a young feller in the mid-1970s, um, it, it was on the spinner rack, which was one of my go-to places. Mm -hmm. And there it was, and it was a Palooster book. I recognized that immediately. But it wasn't by Burroughs. So I snatched that up and read it and enjoyed it. And I, I have not looked at it in a long time, but I, I would, based on my reaction way back when, I would recommend it. Mm -hmm. And I, I have not read the uh, follow up to that Red Axe of Pluster, but I've heard good things about it. So I, I'm excited. Again, this has not been, not been announced. So be aware of that. But I'm, I'm looking forward to, to these possibly being released and joining the ERB universe. Mm -hmm. And um, I should say, you mentioned Tarzan in the Valley of Gold. We did do an episode both on the movie and uh, Fritz Leiber's novelization a Indeed. while back. So everybody jump back and listen to that. Um, <laughs> anything else before we dive into the book itself? Is there anything else um, you guys want to say? No, I'm ready to go. I mean, okay. to go. <laughs> now, I want to warn everyone listening right now. I know this is a relatively new book. And we love it when people listen to us. But if you have not read it, we're going to like spoil everything when we talk about this. So if you haven't read the book yet, pause this podcast right now, get the book, read it, and then come back and listen. Because, because this book is a lot of fun. Um, uh, I think we're all probably going to end up praising this. And it's a lot more fun if you don't know what's coming. So once again, we appreciate those of us, you, of you who are listening to this podcast, if you haven't read the book yet, please wait and listen to the podcast after you've read it. Um, um, because 
We just, we don't want to ruin it for you. We want to talk about how good it is, but that means talking about the events that happen within the book. So spoilers are coming. You have all been warned. So, um, you know, Tarzan and the, uh, Tarzan, the Battle for Pellucidor, um, by Win Scott Eckert. I learned from the author that this is set from September to through December, 1943, in the midst of World War II, as we'll soon see. And it is set just before the events of Tarzan and the Foreign Legion, which is the only World War II era Tarzan book that Edgar Rice Burroughs had wrote. So it's, it's in that timeline at that point. And Jess, you were gonna start us off with a discussion of the first eight chapters. Indeed, and I shall proceed with that. Uh, I, I would add my, my vote of confidence to this book. I think it's excellent and I highly recommend it. Um, and it is chock full of references to other, other works, uh, other mm-hmm. works, primarily Burroughs works. And, and, and has another way of calling that is Easter eggs. Mm-hmm. So I will attempt to identify these uh, for, for, both, for both the chapters I am discussing as well as hopefully um, if, some, if I spot something in some of y'all's chapters. Mm-hmm. So, so, but these, again, this is another reason for you, if you've not listened, if you've not, if you've not read this book, to stop right here with our podcast, go read it, and then come back and listen to what we have to say. Because in my opinion, finding these Easter eggs is really fun. This is something I've, I've taken great delight doing in years in prior Burroughs books, because he'll, he'll drop one of these once in a while. Other authors... <laughs> Star Trek, I'm a big fan of, and I used to read those paperbacks, and they would have uh, references to other other events and other episodes there. Mm-hmm. So, so that that's and, and Star Wars does the same kind of thing. So that's that's always a delight for me as a fan. Mm-hmm. All right, moving now into uh, Tarzan Battle for Pluster, Chapter One, entitled "Strange Invaders." Mm-hmm. Uh, one oh, of the things, Jess, I'm sorry. Okay. Can I interrupt a moment? I just Please realized. Do. that. We, we should mention the foreword, which is fun, in which the author meets someone we know to be Tarzan and gets an account of this adventure. So mm-hmm. they start off by using the same conceit that Burroughs did, that he's not writing fiction, that he's found out these stories from Tarzan or from John Carter or whatever, and he's just recounting them for us. Good point. And that reminds me, and I'm going to go ahead and, and, and say it now, because sometimes somehow it gets overlooked. But in these ERB universe books, one of the last things you find is like a one or two page segment called the quantum interlude. Quantum mm-hmm. interlude, uh, it, it will appear in the table of contents, but for some reason people tend to overlook it. And the intention there with the quantum interlude is to be akin to what Marvel does with their movies. When they finish the movie and the credits are rolling and the credits are done, and if you're still lucky enough to be sitting in the movie theater watching the credits to the last word, then the movie, then another story pops up and it'll run for a few minutes and it will tell you something of great interest to towards the next Marvel uh, movie or an upcoming Marvel movie. It'll give you, uh, I suppose, a, a peek as opposed to a preview. It's not technically a preview, but it's a little peek at some event related to an upcoming Marvel movie. And, and fan, dedicated Marvel fans just live for this kind of thing. And that's what they're doing here with the ERB Universe books with the quantum interlude. So by all means, make sure you take a look-see at that quantum interlude. It's only a couple of pages and generally provides some valuable or interesting information uh, for, for the Burroughs fan and the, and the person who will become a Burroughs fan reading these fine books. Mm-hmm. All right, now let's see. And you're correct about the forward. I'm glad you covered that. Now, one of the, the principles and one of the intentions here with these ERB Universe books and really, it's a good rule of thumb for any book is provide the reader with all the information he or she needs to understand basically what's going on, what's being talked about. So meaning there is some prior information by prior information, I mean, information from prior books mm-hmm. that may um, that, that may be given. For example, there's some time spent on recapping what Pluster is, what Pluster is about, it's which I'm going to do, too, in case you haven't heard any of these podcasts. And this is covered in Chapter one. It's covered throughout the book. Um, but uh, these items are covered in chapter one, which we're looking at now. So the author reminds us that in Pellucidor, it's a subterranean world inside the Earth, roughly 500 miles inside the Earth's surface. Uh, David Ennis, Abner Perry dug their way down there in a mechanical prospector, uh, which in the first uh, Pellucidor book entitled At Their's Core, which I mentioned when I read off the list of uh, Pellucidor books. And this is a mechanical prospector. They, they were looking for a rare ore and minerals that they could, if they could sell for money and, and make money mining. That's, that's what they were doing. 
And little did they realize they had stumbled on a subterranean world. And gee whiz, that's one of those life-changing events for them and other people too. So the Pluster is is an unusual place, and and so, some of the some of the, the the way things work there is a little different than what we have on the on the surface world. For example, they have a sun in Pluster. It's an eternal noonday sun, meaning it hangs in the middle of of the world, in, inside the Earth and burns all the time. There's no nighttime, there's no dusk, there's no dawn. It is eternally at 12 noon. And I would, uh, the way I visualize this, think of a basketball and we are walking and the basketball is the earth and we are walking on the surface of the earth or the surface of the basketball. Pellucidor is again, we'll say a basketball. Pellucidor is on the inside of that basketball. In the very center core of that basketball is a very bright eternal sun. And the people, and this is the thing to grab hold of, the people who live in Pluster every day, they live and die there um, and, and live out their lives and all kinds of, of creatures and, and, and such that we'll, we'll get introduced to some of them. These people are walking around upside down on this inner surface of that basketball or the world. Okay, so if you, if you can grasp the, oh, and also the horizon curls upward, which you see pictured uh, sometimes pretty good in some artwork by Frazetta and Jusco and some others. But that's peculiar to Pluster. That's not something you see in your average everyday planet or exterior uh, world, such as what we have here on the surface of the Earth. And I will, you will hear me refer to the surface world in my uh, synopses here. And I'm talking about, when I say surface world, I'm talking about where we live on the Earth as opposed to the interior of the world where the subterranean world of Pluster, where they're walking around on the inside of the surface. Is that a fair way of explaining explaining yeah, uh, I, the ups and the ups and downs of yeah. all right I very think, good mm -hmm. good I, I think that was a very good uh, explanation well thank you i'll keep my basketball handy in case i need to re recover that <laughs> uh so so the, so Pluster has an, an, an eternal sun uh, an internal and eternal it burns 24 7 there is no night and there are no stars which means there's no astronomical signs no events to determine cardinal directions North, south, east, west are meaningless to the locals at Pluster. They won't know what you're talking about. If you're asking, if, if, well, if you're asking how they get from here to there, they'll say, well, you just know how they get from here to there because they have this homing instinct that gets them home and gets them back to any place that they're familiar with, that they've already been to. And, and people from the surface world can get lost. In fact, I'll, I may say this later on, but I'll just go ahead and mention, on the first trip to Pluster, which was the book Tarzan at the Earth's Core, Tarzan got lost in Pluster. Well, he'll never live that one down. I'm a huge Tarzan fan, so I'm not making fun of him, but poking, uh, poking a little fun, perhaps. But he got lost in Pluster. For him, that's unheard of. So, so he has not forgotten that. And they take precautions in this story because it is a big deal. You spend your entire adventure trying to find where you're supposed to be. That really, really delays things. Um, you have other adventures is what happens. So, so they take great pains to, to uh, be careful of where they are and that they don't get lost. So they've introduced some uh, artificial navigation means. Uh, Von Horst, who was the protagonist in the book Back to the Stone Age, also got lost on that same expedition in Tarzan Thurs Corps. And he ended up finding, you know, his adventure was while he was trying to get, get, get back home, he uh, ran into a young lady, had all, had all kinds of uh, ups and downs, but uh, learned how to live in Pluster and enjoy it and appreciate it. And, he, he decided to stay there. So that, that talking about life-changing events. Mm -hmm. So to address navigational issues of Pluster, Abner Perry and David Innes have arranged for Gridley wave stations at strategic locations throughout Pluster. Now the Gridley wave, that's another story. That was discovered, if not developed, by a young fellow by the name of Jason Gridley, who's a neighbor of Edgar Rice Burroughs. Okay, I need to explain. In the Burroughs <laughs> books, the Burroughs books are written by Edgar Rice Burroughs. But inside the books, there's a fictional Edgar Rice Burroughs, oftentimes referred to as the other Burroughs. And he appears as a character in the books. Sometimes he is, he is the person who the story is being told to, or the person who opened up the bottle that was tossed overboard from a ship or a lost island that has a big story in it. Or sometimes he's gone to the desert to, to uh, attach it to it to pick up a telegraph wire, attach a machine to it, and get a story delivered that way. He, this other Burroughs has done all those kinds of things by getting the story. It's really, it's a frame is what is the, is the technical term for, from the writing world 
which describes how Burroughs came about to, to receive the story and also suggests that, gee, these people are real. It, it helps add to the realness of the story. So Gridley Wave. Jason Gridley discovered this odd radio wave, and he admits in here someplace that he doesn't know how the darn thing works. He just tells people that. Um, so it takes a lot for him to admit that. But, but uh, Abner Perry, who's a noted scientist and developed that um, iron mold that uh, took he and David Ennis to Bluster in the very first uh, book, um, uh, he has worked with the Gridley Wave and, and Jason Gridley, of course, has worked with it. And they've got Gridley Waves set up. There's Gridley Wave on Barsoom and there's a, a Gridley Wave on, on Amtor and Gridley Wave at various surface locations. Tarzan has one in his estate in um, Africa. And there's a uh, one in Tarzana there at uh, Jason Gridley's house. So in Pellucidor, they've got uh, some Gridley wave navigation beams. These these things are toned down a little bit. They run on batteries. You really shouldn't talk on them because they'll just run the battery down if you if you talk too much. But you could use them to send out a simple pulse. I would say like a, perhaps like a Morse code, perhaps. Or if you talk on them, you can do that. Just make your message real short and recognize that someone may need to come over and change the batteries and thing. But these navigational Gridley wave stations send out a homing beacon. Um, and so we'll hear more about this later on. So as the story begins, we join up with a scouting party led by Thruck. Now Thruck is um, a, a follower of, of David Ennis. He's a good guy. They are investigating rumors of a flying monster that does not flap its wings. Now, most likely this is an airplane. I'll just save you some time and tell you that. But it does make one wonder, what is an airplane doing in Pellucidor? Because for the most part, Pellucidor is unsettled, is still pristine, is still a savage world, and not many people in the surface world know it exists. And there's some discussion about that in the book. Um, they, they even say that uh, Burroughs is spinning fictional tales to make sure that people understand that Pellucidor is, fi is fictional and not, not a real deal. And the governments know about Pellucidor, but they know very little about it, too. This, that's all very well done. So Thruck, the leader of the scouting party, is a cousin to Gak the Hairy One, Gak the Hairy One being the king of Sari, S-A-R-I, Sari, or perhaps Sari. Thruck is an acknowledged and respected leader and serves as a captain in David Ennis's army of the Federated Tribes, Federated Tribes of Pellucidor. That's the group that uh, David assembled to battle the Mayhars. We'll talk about that in this in a minute. Also in the scouting party is Dangar, D-A-N-G-A-R, Dangar. Now, here, here's a small Easter egg for you. We first met Dangar in the book Back to the Stone Age, where he befriended that story's protagonist, Von Horst. Dangar taught Von Horst the language of Pluster, and they overcame paralysis that was inflicted by the Chordons. Back to the Stone Age, a fine story. I highly recommend it. Thruck, Dangar, and their party are on the trail of these airplane rumors, wondering what's this airplane doing in Pluster. And they find a wreckage of the plane. They, they describe it as a tube of metal with two long flat arms that attach perpendicular to the body. These arms would be the wings, of course, and the wings that do not flap, I might add, because they're stationary, stationary wings. They even identify the plane's propellers. Now, Thruck, Dangar, and others recognize this in the airplane as based on the description provided them by Abner Perry. So they surmise that the plane, while in flight, encountered a flying reptile. Perhaps a thiptar. Now, thiptar is a looser word for pterodactyl or a flying reptile similar to pterodactyl, pteranodon, possibly. I, I generally use, correct or not, I generally use the word pterodactyl, and thiptar means pterodactyl or, or pteranodon. But they figured that this plane bumped into a thiptar and the propeller was damaged, and that caused the plane to crash. But be clear, creation of airplanes is beyond the technology of anyone known to be in Pluster, with the one exception being Abner Perry, because he did create an airplane, I believe, over in the in the last of the Pluster book, Savage Pluster. But uh, airplanes just really should not be there. So everyone is saying, to whom does this airplane belong and for what purpose? And from the outset, this book, and that is Tarzan Bell of Pluster, stresses that the surface powers, the United States, United Kingdom, are aware of Pluster, but the governments there know very little about it. And the contingent who is familiar with Pluster, and you'll see this group gathered here later on, is Jason Gridley, whom I mentioned, Tarzan, of course, the fictional Edgar Rice Burroughs, also called other ERB that I mentioned a moment ago, David Ennis, David Ennis who is the um, emperor of Pluster, and a few other, other people. Uh, that group does not want an influx of people from the surface world who would despoil Pellucidor. 
who was setting up strip malls and office buildings, urban sprawl and pollution, and just the litter of humanity. They want to keep Pluto pretty much the way it is. Um, nearby to this plane crash, Drux Party finds an unknown city with shiny domes, towers, and Mayhars flying overhead. Gee, a, a lost city. I love lost cities. Mm -hmm. Being well acquainted by the danger and past history of Mayhars, this got everyone's attention. Now, Mayhars, I haven't told you much about, but I stop and talk about them. For the unaware, Mayhars are intelligent winged reptiles that used to rule Pluster when David Ennis and Abner Perry first arrived and discovered Pluster. This led to a federation of Pluster tribes, that is, several tribes and countries banding together in the first two Pluster books to to battle the Mayhars. The Mayhars were not completely wiped out, not completely eradicated, but they were strongly Im impacted and moved them away from the general area of these federated tribes. Mayhars, it's always good to get the other side of the story. Well, Mayhars viewed humans as non-sentient beings useful only as pack animals, and we saw them being used as slaves, or as a dinner delicacy. And yes, there is a chilling chilling sequence in the first book at the Earth's core that Burroughs describes where uh, a Mayhar hypnotizes their victim and then devours that person one at a time. You've probably seen uh, several pieces of artwork, notably by Frank Frazetta. There's another one by Jusco of, of the victim being hypnotized and about to, uh, about to become dinner. Mayhars have advanced metal techniques and discipline, metal discipline. They are big on the hypnotic control of humans and the Sagoth, who are their henchmen, are also hypnotically controlled. Because believe me, Sagoth couldn't come up with some of the things they can't, came up with if they weren't getting mental directions from the Mayhars. Sagars are believed, and note the word believe, this is not official, but they're believed to be related to Mangani on the uh, Earth's surface, that is the Mangani, who are the, the great apes that raised Tarzan, believe that the, they may be similar in, in their makeup and structure to, to, to the Mangani. But, I'm speculating when I say that to be clear. But another odd thing about Mayhars is they use a fourth dimension method to communicate. Now, Abner Perry has a good explanation of this, better than I can offer, so I won't go into that right now. <clears throat> so, Truck and his party are looking around. They found this wrecked airplane and they're looking to see what else there is. Well, they find it. They encounter a man riding a guy or that's the hallucinatory world for Triceratops. Now, instead of that's unusual unto itself because guy ors are generally pretty, pretty, um, aggressive you usually stay out of their way and it's 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 a, like a triceratops it is a triceratops it's just what they call it now but instead of animal skins which most people in blue wear this person riding the gower is wearing surface type clothing with military markings and i'll just tell you one of the military markings is the swastika um the author kind of lets the reader figure that out and i'll just tell you that's a swastika so the nazis are here of course, Thruck and the reader are left to figure this out. Did we cover that? And we have talked about spoiler alerts. So I've already given you some spoilers, so I hope you don't mind that. Mm -hmm. Now, just in case there's any doubt, yes, we found out the guy. Oh, the guy or has a swastika emblem on its hump, also on its backside. So, so this very clearly, this is what we're dealing with. So the Nazi Nazi trooper riding a guy or was followed by a whole bunch of others in the same attire, also riding guys and brandishing 42H submachine guns. Now, they, thanks to Abner Perry, they do have rifles in Blooster because uh, David Ennis's army is outfitted with breech-loading rifles. Notice I said breech-loading rifles. These Nazis have submachine guns. Big difference there. And Thruck's party, as I said, was outgunned and was totally un unaware of the submachine gun. They had never faced a weapon like that. So very quickly, a massacre ensued with only one known survivor, and that was Dangar, whom I mentioned earlier uh, as, as when I started talking, Dangar, who we had met in back of the Stone Age. And once the Nazi stormtroopers leave, Dangar salvages a couple of rifles and ammunition and then makes his way to the kingdom of Kali, K-A-L-I, Kali, where he knows there is a gridly wave nav navigational beacon, and he can use that thing to message people and say, we have a problem here, come mm -hmm. help. And uh, um, I just wanted to add that um, um, first, uh, Dangar survives because he is has corpses of some of his fellow Clusidorians on top of him, so they don't they just don't notice that he's not dead. So it was a perfectly reasonable way for him to survive. 
Um, and I also enjoyed the way Eckert described the swastika and the Germans. We know clearly who they are. There's no question. Right. But he, but of course, Dangar won't know the word swastika, so he never uses it because this this uh, chapter it's in the third person, but it's from his point of view. Very good. Uh, yes. So so Eckert does a very skillful job of describing um, the Nazis to let us know they're Nazis without using any words that Dangar would be unfamiliar with. And it was a very nice bit of storytelling. And that's a very good point because that explains why he let, when I said he let the reader figure it out, figure it out what I meant was he did not, he, the writer, the author, no. did, did not use the word swastika. Um, but you're correct. That, that's a very good point. So hearing about all this, David Ennis, via Gridley Wave, contacts Jason Gridley to tell the surface world that Nazis have arrived in Pluster and that they need help down there in Pluster. Uh, they, David Ennis, that is, needs help. So that's all for chapter one. Any further comments regarding chapter one? Um, now I, I was gonna, did they actually mention, we know, for those of us who have read the books know that there is an entrance to Pelucidor at the, at the North Pole, which is how Tarzan and his party got in and Tarzan, that's the Earth core. Uh, I can't remember if that was mentioned yet here or- It's not, it's not mentioned yet. We will certainly okay. hear, about, hear about now, but okay. to that point, let me say that this uh, lost city that was mentioned and this airplane down mm -hmm. is relatively close to that polar opening. I cannot say how far away, but it's up in the same neighborhood, I would say. Okay. And that's kind of the neat thing about Pellucidor as a place to have adventures. It's a huge world um, where, um, uh, you know, uh, their land mirrors our oceans. Isn't that true about yes. Pellucidor? Yes, yes. So they have yes. like, yes. they have it's like- inverse three relationship, yes. Right. So they have three times the land area at least. So right. the the Pellucidor books by Edgar Rice Burroughs really only cover a small fraction of that world. So it's perfectly reasonable for another writer to move to another area of Pellucidor and still have either surviving mayors or new creatures we hadn't otherwise met. Or, and it all fits into that world without contradicting anything that happened before. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Very good point. Very, very good point. And, and, and that's, I think that is why when David Ennis's federated tribes were battling the Mayhar, they just pushed the Mayhar out of their immediate area mm -hmm. um, and did not try to eradicate them, did, did not try to commit, uh, I think the word is genocide, to totally wipe them out. Yeah. Um, and, and in fact, some of the value of the story, as I said, it's, it's good to, to get both sides of, of the story. And, and learning about things from the Mayhar perspective, not that I'm going to sit here and defend Mayhars, I don't mean that, but getting things from their perspective can be of interest. And there is that is touched on much later in the book, which you all will be talking about. Uh, but thank you for your comments, and you're very correct. Uh, the author, Win Scott Ecker, did indeed let, let the reader figure out that that was... Uh, uh, the Nazis squashed the symbol. Yeah, and, well, and it's, a, it's a great promise. If you say to me there are Nazis in Pellucidor in this book, then I say to you, just, you know, shut up and take my money. I have to read it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Nazis and dinosaurs, you can't go wrong. Exactly. Yes. I agree. You know, I, it's I, like, I okay, yeah, okay, I have to read this now. So I, I agree totally. Well, and, I, and I, I don't want to go off topic, but I have to point out, Indiana Jones, who was about the same, the movies, who was about mm -hmm. the same time period, faced off against Nazis twice, and, and uh, yeah. that was certainly part of the appeal there. Mm -hmm. Moving into chapter two, entitled Escape from Lutha. This chapter reminds us that Tarzan spent some time as an agent working for the French in Algeria, as told in Return of Tarzan. We know that Tarzan is snuck into and out of countless strongholds on his own, or he can certainly do it as a secret agent. And he does so here with some theatrics. For the Easter egg basket, it's no, important to note that chapter two takes place in the fictional European country of Lutha that we saw in the Burroughs book, Mad King. Now, since Mad King was written, Luther had become an independent protectorate of its neighbor, Serbia. And that's a direct quote from the book, from this book, who was, but Serbia was eventually occupied by the Germans. So instead of being a king, Barney Custer is still in charge as the premier of, uh, of Luther. And Barney Custer, of course, was the protagonist from the Mad King. Uh, note that in, in reading the story that Tarzan is, and this is a spoiler, Tarzan is masquerading as Von der Blut, der Blut 
uh, von, three words, von der Blut, B-L-U-T-E, Blut. And I was curious if that was name was a reference to something. I could not uh, locate that. I did some brief research, but did not did not uh, see where that name possibly could have come from. Uh, Tarzan's mission as von der, von der Blut uh, is to retrieve a Nazi scientist who is defecting to the Allies. And we quickly find that von der Blut has gray eyes, a steel knife, and others a feral growl. So we know that's Tarzan. The reader is given those hints. Under the cover of darkness, Tarzan with his, um, uh, I don't want to say hostage, with the defector, is carefully making their way to the seaport with Tarzan dispatching Nazi guards as he needs. As a distraction, Tarzan blows up a munitions warehouse, which was a secondary objective of his mission. Now, you'll have to talk about this here later on. Um, and after, but after an hour wait, the British sub arrives and whisks the two of them to safety. Note that the person Tarzan is extracting is a Dr. Erhard Drexler, Drexler, D-R-E-C-H-S-L-E-R, -E and we will hear more from him later on. So that's my summary of chapter two, brief, but I'll make up for it with other things. Any what, comments on chapter two? Uh, what I enjoyed about this chapter is first, he never overtly identifies Tarzan, but I think it's obvious to anyone reading it, right. even if you're not a huge Burroughs reader who it's supposed to be. Um, and I like that it presents Tarzan not just as a great fighter, but has smart and quick thinking as, uh, as much as athletic, because he improvises a lot of the tactics he uses, but so he's quick on his feet. He's thinking as he's fighting. He's not just blindly slashing out. And that is the definition of how Tarzan handles himself in a fight. He always fights intelligently. Very good. Uh, I think, let me, oh, go sorry. ahead, please, go ahead. I was going to say, I think uh, uh, when Scott Eckert here too does a good job of the description because uh, with uh, Burl's doing it, they got the uh, the gray eyes and the, uh, you know, uh, descriptions they use that you know that if, if you read the other books, here's, here's Tarzan. And what was interesting is last weekend, I could not remember, uh, what short story it was reading is a Western, I believe. Yeah, it's a Western. Um, but, uh, the main uh, character in it, they described him getting ready to uh, uh, meet up with his first uh, duel or uh, gun down or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> and I'm like, I finished it, I'm like, reading what the guy wrote I said this guy's read Burroughs <laughs> <laughs> because he talked about the uh, you know uh, I'm going to paraphrase here but uh, uh, tall but not lanky broad shouldered but not muscular but the hardened face looked with the thin gray eyes <laughs> it just it was it was just a side note there as, as funny obviously other people have been influenced by that Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's a great point. Perhaps Tarzan was moonlighting uh, in the old west there. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. We oh, now. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna ask now. Doctor Dreschler is a new character, right? I couldn't find yes. any reference to him. Uh, right. Well, so far as I could tell, that's good. That's actually a very good question. Yeah. So far as I could tell, he is a new character, mm -hmm. and he, he's a bit of a pain in the posterior too. I'm not sure yeah. why he's defecting because he keeps making noise. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Maybe the, maybe the Germans said leave. That could that could be what happened. They may have gotten tired of dealing with him. Um, let's see, where am I? Am I going to chapter three now? Chapter three, yes, yes. Uh, very good. That chapter is entitled Suzanne. And uh, by the way, Tim, you provided some very good uh, short summaries. Are you are you ex, ex, are you uh, referencing those? I am. Yes. Good. I thought yeah. you were, so I won't bother reading them because I was going to do that. But I thought I thought I recognized the wording there. All right. Very good. Uh, chapter three is entitled Suzanne. Now we're introduced here in chapter three to a new character, a young lady by the name of Suzanne. She is Korok's daughter. That would make her Tarzan's granddaughter. Suzanne would be Jackie's sister. We saw Jackie as an infant in Tarzan and the Ant-Man. Uh, if you recall that book, um, Jackie wanted to go riding in the airplane, but he was just big enough to talk and couldn't even pronounce his own name. Um, but that's... That is uh, Suzanne's brother. Uh, we discover that Suzanne's in a dark cavern. 
she doesn't quite know where she is. She's just woke up. She's been unconscious for quite a while. Uh, we do know that Suzanne's in Pellucidor, uh, and she's been there just long enough to have injured her right ankle, ankle, yeah, right ankle, and left knee. Neither seriously, but it's a painful nuisance requiring rest. Pellucidor is no place to rest. There's always something going on, something ready to eat you. We don't know, and she doesn't know how she arrived in the dark cavern, but she does have a serious bump on her head with a headache. Oh, that's another clue. Suzanne is missing her revolver and wristwatch. Her clothing is tattered and torn, leaving her mostly naked. Suzanne's about six foot tall, athletic, and being related to Tarzan and Korok, she is well-versed in taking care of herself in the jungle. So she, she, she's, she's okay, even without a weapon. She's, she's got the basic, uh, basic tools there but uh, needs to get healed up and be alert. So, uh, for example, Suzanne was an accomplished long jumper as an athlete, but she sees a, an abyss or a chasm that's so wide, she can't leap over the thing. In particular, if she's got, uh, got ailing uh, ankles and, and knees and such, um, she shouldn't be trying to jump across that, that chasm. And across the way on the other side of that chasm is a group of human-like brutes and I'll just tell you right now, just to keep this simple, these are Gorbuses. Now, we've met Gorbuses in the book Back to the Stone Age. And that's the first, uh, that's the Pellucidor book that has uh, Von Horst in it, which, as I, I mentioned him earlier. So this is another uh, Easter egg here, a reference to Gorbuses. The Gorbuses um, are cannibals. And if you listen to them talk, they will make references to a past life on the surface world every once in a while. That is up here where we are. Every once in a while, they'll they'll spit out some English and and or a familiar language. It could be could be French or something like that. But they'll say something as familiar um, using a word like "gun," which we're going to see here in just a moment. So those are the Gorbuses, and as I said, they have first appeared in back to the Stone Age. Uh, hang on, I forgot to get my swig of Granny's iced tea during our, during our. <laughs> I promised myself I was going to do that. And I done forgot. Gorbuses have, they're pretty recognizable. Uh, they're repulsive, actually. Uh, they have stringy white hair, snow white skin, and pinky reddish eyes with brutish expressions. And that's more or less a quote. And then I mentioned long fangs, like tusk. Uh, they are cannibals, so they have long fangs, uh, and they know how to use them. Their remaining teeth are yellow and sharpened. All the better to bite you with, I suppose. And I did say Gorbuses are cannibals with a sordid past meaning that most of them that we've met at least, uh, shall we say, were, were villains or, or led a, uh, led a non-productive life on the surface world or seen based on who we think they are. Now, these Gorbis characters will toss food across the chasm. I mentioned that big chasm that Suzanne could not jump across. Well, the Gorbis is on the other side and they're tossing food across. And one of my favorite questions is to ask in, in, in any situation is why do people do what they do? Why are these garbuses tossing food across the chasm? Well, on Suzanne's side of the chasm is a group of people who are pretty human. They are your typical cave people, prehistoric people with more normal features and behavior, uh, civilized behavior, I would say. Suzanne attempts to speak with these immediate neighbors, the ones on the same side of the chasm as her, but she has little success even though she tries English, French, German, Spanish, Italian, and some Russian. Recall that she had a bop on her head, and I'm not saying she's, she's um, suffering from amnesia, but maybe it's a little groggy. I think but at this point, she's figured out, she remembers that she's in Bluster. How she got here, she doesn't recall. And I should just tell you right now that at this point, uh, the events that led up to Suzanne being in this cavern in Bluster will be told here shortly as a flashback. So I'll just go ahead and tell you that. But it doesn't it certainly does not detract from the story because this is all very interesting. Suzanne's been observing these Gorbuses across the chasm and she recognizes they're not generous. They're pretty much self-centered, but they will still toss food to the people on her side. Now, why would they do this? After some sleep, Suzanne got to feeling better so that she could retrieve some of the food that was tossed tossed across the chasm so she could eat. Now, oh, and recognize that another oddity about Pellucidor, because their sun doesn't move, there's just no effective way to measure time. In fact, I've seen Pellucidarians say, I don't believe in minutes. That's a quote out of this book. One of the girls from Pellucidor says, I don't believe in minutes, because time, time is really 
unknown to them. The only way that they even attempt to measure time is by the number of sleeps. Of course, that's very going very by the person. As to one person might have one sleep and another person might have 10 sleeps in the same time period. So several sleeps passed for Suzanne, napping as best she could, participating in food toss, and trying to communicate with her neighbors. But gradually her injuries did improve. So all this took time, days, weeks, perhaps. She's down here like this. And after a while, the Gorbises on the far side tossed a rope across the chest. Now, why were they doing that? They were tossing food, now they're tossing a rope. And that rope was retrieved by some of Suzanne's neighbors on her side, placed over one of the people there on Suzanne's side. And then the Gorbises on the over on the chasm side have the other end of the rope and they pull, a bunch of them will get on the rope on that end and pull and drag this poor person with the uh, rope wrapped around him, drag him across the ground, across the chasm where he swings down on the rope and bangs against the wall. You hear a crunch, you hear a thud and he doesn't move anymore. So he's killed when this happens. And then the Gorbis is pulling him up on the rope to where they are and main course for dinner. I did say they're cannibals. Hearing the Gorbises across the Great Divide, Suzanne would pick up a smattering of recognizable English words such as tenderize. Yes, tenderize, he said, banging, banging these poor victims against the wall is tenderizing them. The Gorbises are known to make references to past life. I've mentioned that already. I'm repeating myself. Suzanne tries to make, with all this going on, Suzanne tries to make friends with, with one of the people on her side called Lordan. Now, Lordan is mad because Suzanne killed his pet Bustar. A Bustar is a small Thipdar that he wrote. Bustars are new to the story. We've not seen them before. But Lordan's people have a way of communicating with the um, Bustar and have they develop a relationship really uh, uh, with, with the, with the uh, uh, like a you know, pet owner relationship uh, with the Bustar. And they ride the bus stars. They fly around these bus stars. Lord Dan is pretty belligerent towards Suzanne, but he does cooperate to some degree by teaching her the language. This chapter with Suzanne, <coughs> excuse me, this chapter with Suzanne and the Gorbus is a favorite of mine. Notably, when one of the Gorbuses, get this, one of the Gorbuses produces a gun that Suzanne recognizes her own. Remember, I said she'd lost her gun. Suzanne watches this Gorbus, explains the use of the, of, of the gun to his fellow Gorbuses. And then one of the Gorbuses says he doesn't know what he's talking about. So the Gorbus with the gun demonstrates. He, he, the other fellow gets hold of the gun. Oh, he, he asks how to use it. So the Gorbus, the first Gorbus tells him, well, you take this, this muzzle, this round cylinder thing, and you stick that in your, in your mouth. And then this other thing down here is a trigger. You squeeze that with your thumb. So he's got the gun pointed at his mouth and then squeezes the trigger and blows his head off. Uh, I just thought that was so funny. Isn't that morbid of me? But I, th I just thought that was so funny. <laughs> there is yep. a, there is someone in one of the later Tarzian books, and I've forgotten which one, who uses that trick when he's captured by primitive people who take his gun to get the guy to shoot himself. Um, it's one of the later books. Are you sure it's not in one of the earlier books? Uh, maybe wrong, because I can't remember what book it is. It's well, like... A, like, like the guy, the guy and his girl are a prisoner of this lost civilization. They ask what the mm -hmm. gun is, mm -hmm. and um, he says, "Well, look down the barrel and push, pull the trigger, and a light will come on. You'll see how it works." That's that. I'm glad you mentioned that because I can tell you who this corpus is. I'll get that here in a minute. Mm -hmm. And I was warning you, perhaps what you've discovered there, because I, I couldn't, I didn't realize that it might be just another clue as to who this person is. Yeah, uh, I think it was a later book, so it wasn't Rokoff. So. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, sorry. Well, that's, that's, kind that's of, where kind I was of, going. Yeah, kind kind of going off on a tangent there. I'm sorry. That's perfect. <laughs> okay, it's an interesting tangent. That's worth that's worth some research mm -hmm. later on. Mm -hmm. So the Gorbises refers to the surface world as the world of forgotten mysteries, because apparently they have a smattering of memories from that world. And these Gorbises are from different time periods. Some of the Gorbises remember guns, others don't remember guns. Uh, one spoke of killing a lover with poison, another only remembered swords. In this instance, Suzanne is hearing English words, and she's wondering, how could Gorbuses at the Earth's core know English? Of course, she doesn't realize that they may be departed spirits from the surface world. <clears throat> oh, and then this phrase was uttered by one of the Gorbuses. So um, keep this in mind for future use in the ERB universe. Uh, list, talking to our listeners here, this is a, th these are terms you're going to hear later on in the ERB universe books. 
Lenny Scorbis says, maybe they tectaculated to the angle of forgotten memories. Tectaculate and angles are words you're going to hear later on in ERB Universe books. Maybe they tectaculated to the angle of forgotten memories. With no luck, Suzanne tries to warn her companions that they're being fattened for slaughter. She's finally figured out all this food coming across and people are eating on her side is to fatten them up so the Gorbises can um, <laughs> rope them and drag them across and then eat them. Suzanne's health is improving, so she's pondering an escape. She learns that she can leap to grasp. They're inside a cavern. So she learns she can leap to grasp the stalactites hanging from the ceiling and then by switching hands can move from one stalactite to another so that she uh, can work her way across the chasm. Now, this is dangerous, needless to say. Stalactite might break, her hold may slip, any number of things could happen here. She is a good athlete. That does help. So at this point, the chapter ends with Suzanne doing a flashback that is told in the next chapter. So as I said, we will find out how she got here. Before I leave, oh yes, before I leave chapter three, here's a spoiler. Uh, if you don't want spoilers, skip ahead, but I think we've already touched on so we've identified one of these Gorbises has a Russian accent, makes reference to fool enemies and finding children, and kills jealous husbands and doodles. These are references to the events in the return of Tarzan and the beast of Tarzan. Uh, this Gorbis is Rockoff, which we mentioned a moment ago. Uh, so I'll just, I'll just, that's a, that's a spoiler that Gorbis is Rockoff. That, that is my favorite Easter egg in the book. That is just really clever. Um, Eckhart never overtly says it's Rokoff. If you're not familiar right. with Return and Beast of Tarzan, you won't recognize who he is, but it doesn't spoil the story at all. It's right. just a great Easter. It's there is exactly the, for the, exactly the reason Easter egg should be. For the fans of Burroughs' universe who know everything backwards and forwards, they'll get who he <laughs> is. For everybody mm -hmm. else, it just makes him that much more bizarre and creepy, and it works uh, on that it, level. Exactly, and, and I, it, it's joy. It's a joy of discovery, is what it is. Mm -hmm. And to me, it, it it's thrilling, absolutely mm -hmm. thrilling, to go through this and and find things like that. I just I get, get a big kick out of that. And I've run into this technique in, in other stories, um, so th this is always a delight to see this. And mm -hmm. and uh, I hesitated to go to this level of detail, and that's why I, we are tr giving spoilers and saying make sure you want to hear this before you hear it yeah <laughs> because that is a joy of discovery that i would not want uh, to cheat anybody from we've got a couple more things like that but i agree this whole chapter with uh, uh chapter three there with suzanne and gorbis is, is a favorite chapter of mine not mm -hmm. not that i lean towards the macabre or whatever but i just i just find some of these sequences to be human humorous and entertaining they are they definitely are and by the way it was in tarzan triumphant the 15th book in the series where a a uh, character with being held prisoner does the trick with the gun, tells the guy to look down it and pull the trigger. So, Thank you. Yeah. And I, I would be interesting if like uh, Mr. Eckert remembered that and had the same thing happen in this book, or if he just like thought of it on his own, because it works. It's a really cool sequence in both books. Mm -hmm. Well, I, right. I think it is. I think it is cool. And it's, it's a trick worth repeating in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And there's, there's some instances in, in, this which i think are good movie moments mm -hmm. and i could certainly see that kind of thing being in a movie that that wouldn't surprise me at all i can name a couple westerns where where i where i could see that kind of thing having been done <coughs> any further comments before we move into chapter uh, four no yep i'm no. i'm okay very well that chapter four is entitled london confidential now we're still in suzanne's flashback and i should note uh, for the up forthcoming chapters that we are still in Suzanne's flashback with each chapter. So that's not a real big deal, but I think it's interesting to know. Um, Paul Mall in, ah, gee, I think I pronounced that correctly. I've worked on that this afternoon. Paul Mall in London, that's down two for two, was the home of gentlemen's clubs and the war office in the 19th century. Ian Fleming, the creator of James Bond, was a regular visitor for lunch in the dining room in the early days of the 20th century. And in the Sherlock Holmes stories, Fleming's brother, Mycroft, works at Paul Mall. Mycroft is known to be a government official working for British intelligence. Now, why am I talking about this? Because Tarzan goes to Paul Mall in chapter four, London Confidential, and there he meets somebody. And I will, here's no spoiler, I'll just tell you, here's no spoiler. While we don't get a name, the person that Tarzan meets, I believe, believe he said, is Mycroft Holmes. 
who works for British mm. intelligence and, and who Tarzan is Lord Greystoke and all his little military mission there that we saw is reporting to. Yeah, and there's yeah, another I, person. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I had the impression it was like, sounded like Mycroft too. That would make Mycroft awful old. And I'm like, Tarzan, he doesn't act, act, he doesn't presumably, as far as we know, have access to immortality pills. So, mm -hmm. um, so it's a neat idea that he's Mycroft. I'm not sure it fits into a reasonable timeline for the character. Well, I'm glad you pointed that out because I could be wrong. What I'm offering here, and actually on, on the on the Gorbis thing too, this is my opinion. Mm -hmm. This I've not verified these with the author or anything like that. I should clarify this is my opinion. So yeah, perhaps it is somebody else. That that could be. You got me thinking now. It could be somebody else. Yeah. I did, I did, I, that, 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 yeah it's a very valuable point. So that so we'll leave it to the readers to figure it out. I uh, welcome mm -hmm. their comments. So in this meeting, uh this person who I thought was Mycroft and Tarzan and Mr. Smith or Smythe review Tarzan's mission and the escape with Dressler. We find out that Jane is safe in the UK uh, from, from the troubles of World War II. And they discuss the recent findings of that airplane in Pellucido. Um, they, they describe the lost city of Ultima Thule and its hist historical significance with the chance there may be ancient weapons in that city. And that city might be in Pellucider. And you recall, we did see a lost city earlier when we, we were with the um, Thruxa party. They also described Himmler's interest in mythical weapons, which again was touched on in uh, one of the Indiana Jones films. Uh, Tarzan is careful and reserved in his comments about Pellucider because, as I said earlier, he and his group uh, are very careful about talking about Pellucider. And, and revealing any more information than necessary. But the, the uh, British, the UK uh, intelligence service that this person and Tarzan report to, this person that I believe is Mike Roll, and, and Tarzan report to, um, have spoken with Jason Gridley, recognize that there's Nazis in Pluster and that's a bad thing. So uh, Tarzan is ordered as a British intelligence agent to join Jason Greeley on his expedition to Pluster. In my opinion, Tarzan was going to go anyhow. He's just uh, he's just got he's just got an additional reason to go. <laughs> so that's my that's my comments for Chapter Four, London Confidential. Any yeah, comment? And, um, I will comment that I just looked it up, and Mycroft Holmes, the best guess for his birthday is 1847. So presuming he's still mentally active at 96, which he's Mycroft Holmes, I'm sure he would be. That could be Mycroft there. We, they are, so your guess is a better one than I thought. Well, I appreciate you looking that up because I do endeavor to be accurate and I'm sitting here kicking myself. I'm surprised you all didn't hear it. I was sitting here <laughs> kicking myself for not having explored the, the age possibility. Mm -hmm. He could still be He could still be going. Uh, Mycroft could still be yeah. alive. Uh, yeah, because uh, yeah, you, don't, you don't picture either Mycroft or Sherlock going senile or, or in their old age. They would stay sharp until the day they died. I agree, I agree with that. And uh, yeah. I, while I don't know Mycroft as well as I know Sherlock, and I don't know Sherlock that well, uh, my impression is that both of them would take care of themselves physically and uh, eat right and exercise and that sort of thing. And uh, still be, I think, would still be mentally sharp as, as long as, as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. So um, whoever that person is, uh, Tarzan just met with him. And we have finished up Chapter 4. Any further comments regarding Chapter 4? Yep, I'm okay to move on. Very well. Chapter five. I have chapter five as entitled Tarzan. I hope that's not a typo on my part. We are still in chapter five. We are still in Suzanne's flashback. And yes, yes, he said. Tarzana, not Tarzana. Chapter five is Tarzana. I didn't think that was right. Because events take place in Tarzana. California. Tarzana, California is where uh, Jason Gridley lives, and that's where everybody is meeting. So note that we are still in Suzanne's flashbook. So we're, we're at a meeting in Tarzana, California. This is at Jason Gridley's house. And here we meet several people who will figure in the remainder of this book. Note that ERB, the real ERB or the other boroughs, neither one of them are in this meeting because ERB is in Hawaii. So at this meeting is Jason Gridley, the inventor of the Gridley wave, and a person who has popped up uh, in some of the original stories that Burroughs wrote. Generally, 
by way of his Gridley wave. He has some kind of a reference in those books. And Jason Gridley is also popping up literally in, in these ERB universe books. He made a couple of pop-up appearances in the Carson book. And of course, here he is as a major figure in this uh, Tarzan battle for Blooster. The Carson book, I said, is Carson and Venus, uh, Edge of All Worlds. That's the ERB universe book. Uh, another person this meeting is J Jana, the red flower of Zoram. She's a native Pluster. She's married to Jason Gridley. They met during the events of Tarzan at the Earth's core, where uh, Jason Gridley crashed his airplane. He bumped into a pterodactyl, crashed his airplane, and Jana went over and rescued him. And there's some really neat uh, Joe Jesco artwork of uh, Jana watching Jason Gridley's uh, plane uh, catch fire from the collision and, and crash to the ground. So I would recommend that Joe Jesco artwork. Suzanne, we've already met her. Now, again, this is in flashback. So, so this occurs before Suzanne wakes up in that cavern with the Gorbises. Um, we do learn that Suz here that Suzanne is a member of a joint British-French special missions team. We, uh, we see also at this meeting Captain Zupner. He was the captain of the 0220 airship in Tarzan at the Earth's core and also the captain of that same airship in the short story Tarzan and the Land the Time Forgot, short story written by uh, Joe Lansdale, which appears in the in the collection of Worlds of Edgar Rice Burroughs that was edited by Mike Resnick and Bob Garcia. Um, a fine collection of short stories we talked about in my group just recently. Uh, that story is Joe Lansdale's Tarzan Land the Time Forgot. So Zupner has uh, is an accomplished and experienced captain in, the, in running the uh, 0220 airship. Although in that story written by Joe Lansdale, Tarzan Land, Time Forgot, the original 0220, 0220 airship crashed um, and, and was destroyed, hence the need to build a new one, which we'll talk about here in just a moment. And we also run into Heinz, who was a navigator in Tarzan at the Earth's core, and in that Joe Lansdale story, Tarzan and the Land of Time Forgot. Uh, Eric von Harbin is mentioned he has, it news comes out that he has provided a new shipment of Harbonite, an essential element in the construction of the new, as well as the original 0220. Now, um, Eric von Harbin was a character in Tarzan and the Lost Empire. And in that book, it is described how he discovered a mineral in Africa uh, near to the, uh, the cities that were the Lost Empire, the Roman Empire. He discovered a mineral called harbonite and has some special properties. It's very tough and very resilient among other, and lightweight, among other things. So that's why it's essential in construction of these airships. Harbonite is found in the Weir and Wazi Mountains of Africa. That's over near where Tarzan and Los Park took place. But we find out here in the story, we discover that the supply is possibly close to exhaustion. And the existence of Harbonite is a closely guarded secret. They don't want the Nazis to know about it. And actually, Tarzan's group here doesn't really want the governments to know about it either, because the governments will find a way to use it. Stuff has some value. And we've already found out this in short supply. And yes, Eric's sister, Eric von Harbin's sister, Gretchen, is mentioned as living in Pluster and married to Naduk. N-A-D-O-K, he's a young fellow from Pluster. His name is Naduk, and Gretchen is married to him. Now, Gretchen von Harbin, that I think you all have heard me mention before, as at the age, now she's older here in this story, but at the age of 12, she was a young lady in the book Tarzan and the Tarzan Twins with Jad Balja. She was um, abducted by some renegade priest out of Opar, and Tarzan had to move in there and rescue her, which he did, did successfully along with the uh, uh, Tarzan twins, a uh, couple of boys that were spending the summer with him. So Gretchen is all growing up now. She's married and living in Pellucidur. Her daughter is Victory Harbin or Von Harbin, and we'll find out more about Victory here after a while. Also at this meeting is Jason and Janice's son, Jansen. They've taken the two names and put them together. Jansen, J-A-N-S-O-N. Young Jansen is 13 years old. Easter egg. There is a mention during their discussion of Billy Perry. And I looked this up to double check it. I thought it was the case. There's a mention of Billy Perry who stole an airship in the Burroughs story Pirate Blood. Um, he, he might be a distant relative of Abner Perry, but um, 
but you'll see that Easter egg, so be on the lookout for that. Mm-hmm. And in their meeting, they recap the events of Tarzan at the Earth's core. Jana raises a fuss with her husband. And this is, in some respect, I, in some respects, humorous. Um, although for Jason Gridley, it probably wasn't funny. Uh, Jana, Jana, the red flower is Oran, who's married to Jason, raises a fuss that she has not not this depluser she, she came to the surface world that's been at least 13 years ago because her son is 13 years old so she's fussing with her husband about wanting to go back to this depluser she's got friends there she's got family there she, uh, victory von harben is their goddaughter uh, she has not met victory but jason gridley has made several trips down the depluser uh, on the 0220 but she's not she's been stuck at home so she just lets him know about it, to be honest about it so Jan is wanting to go with the Pluster to visit, visit with uh, Victory. Um, oh, be on the lookout talking about Easter eggs. And you got to watch for it. This is like one sentence. There's a mention of Tyler aircraft. You see the word Tyler, your ears should perk up because that would be a reference to Bowman Tyler from the land that time forgot. And Tyler Aircraft and Tyler Submarine Company, um, if you remember um, that uh, Bowman Tyler's uh, family uh, ran a company that built submarines, uh, are based on the West Coast in California and looks like they have an operation near Tarzana. So there's a reference there to Bowman Tyler. If you see Tyler aircraft. There's also an Easter egg mention of Stanley Moritz, who's also with Tyler aircraft. Now, Stanley Moritz, uh, we mentioned earlier about the Red Axe uh, and um, Mayhar, the book Mayhar is a Blooster. Stanley Moritz is a scientist who appears in those books written by um, John, John Eric Holmes. And uh, he invented a matter transfer device that the, that the protagonist, Chris West, of the Mayhar of Pluster book used to transport down to Pluster. And he did so in a hurry because they saw there was a young lady down there having trouble. So he grabs a red axe off the wall, ju- jumps in the matter transmitter, and goes down there to save to save her. But Stanley Moritz uh, is mentioned in this book also, in this book, Tarzan's Battle of Pluster. So that's another Easter egg for you. Um, oh, and another theory that comes up that in this discussion is what I call, I don't think they use this phrase, but I would describe it as point-to-point flight through Pluster's atmosphere. So typically, when the 0220 goes to Pluster and they're trying to get from point A to point B, they will fly above the surface, kind of hug the surface, so to speak, to get from one point to another. But the idea of point-to-point flight is to actually plot a straight line. If you're on one side of the inner world and you need to get to the other side of the inner world, plot a straight line. Now, you want to avoid the sun. Be mindful of that. You can't go too near the sun. But they believe that there are air currents and differences in air pressure depending on where you are in the atmosphere in Pluster. So you have to be mindful of that. When they built this new O220, they've taken that into consideration. So they do have the means to handle changes in air pressure there. But they haven't actually tried it. So they discuss it in this meeting. And there will be a point in the story where they do try point-to-point flight through the Pluster's atmosphere. Just be mindful of where the sun is. Don't bump into that. And there's also a, a pendant moon hanging up there. You don't want to run into that thing either. Mm. And oh, they also describe the armaments and the interior of the O220. And I'm going to have to read from the book on this one. That's on page, I'm using a soft cover copy of uh, Tarzan Bell Booster. That's on page 52. It's a pretty impressive ship, actually. Eight gunnery stations, four starboard and four port, all situated to provide fleet coverage against threats coming from above, forward, below, or astern. Two more gunnery stations, one dorsal and one ventral, the latter located immediately behind the main interior cabin, completed defensive arguments. Each of the 10 gunnery stations was equipped with machine gun turrets and narrow sliding ports from which rifles could be fired, and all were complemented by an adjacent observation blister from which a crewman could help the gunner to sight. Interior vertical shafts led directly from the crew quarters to the gunnery stations to enable the fastest response possible in the event of an attack. And that's good stuff to know because they will be using these here at some point. This <laughs> is Battle of Blooster, and that means there is shooting. They have a plane, and they have uh, I believe it's two auto gyros, and we'll see those auto gyros in action also. And that completes my comments for chapter five. Do you all have anything to say?
Uh, I was going to say, I know that, that there's that really fun description of the layout of the 0220. Yes. And it just makes me think that unless someone's done it already and I'm not aware of it, I would love to see like a blueprint book of the vehicles mm. of the Edgar Rice Burroughs universe. You know, oh, that's that, a wonderful and, idea. And uh, Martian flying machine or, or Martian, you know, aircraft and, um, you know, whatever they can think of. The Zeppelin that from the pirate play. <coughs> Those uh, uh, cut cutaway Iron drawings. Holes. Yeah, the cutaway drawing books. They've done them for Star Wars and other things. Uh, you know, uh, the Iron Mole. There's some cool vehicles in here. Mm -hmm. I would I would love to see like a cutaway blueprint uh, book uh, detailing some of those. That would just be so much fun. That's an excellent idea. And there might be a, 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 a I'll say a smattering of, of drawings akin to that, perhaps mm -hmm. not a detailed cutaway. I, I'm a fan of cutaways also. I've got a picture of the Batcave cutaway that I keep handy here just in case I, just in case I need it. <laughs> One never knows. Got to be One prepared. never knows. Um, but I agree, never... I agree totally. That's a great idea. And and that yeah. description, that, there's more detail in that book. That's on page, what did I say? 52 in the soft cover mm -hmm. edition. And and there's it's in the hardcover edition somewhere. But uh, there's a lot more detail there that I did not go into. Mm -hmm. um, but I agree. The, the cutaways would be, would be very slick. And um, I have, and I'm a fan of the Iron Mole, and I've collected several pictures devoted to the Iron Mole. I don't think I've had the cutaway of that. It's been a while since I've looked at those, but uh, that's that's a neat idea. I agree totally. Any other thoughts? Um, no, I did. This one was, as you've mentioned, packed full of um, of Easter eggs and a lot of fun ones. Just you know, uh, they're building this at Tyler <laughs> Aviation. That's just you know things like that. When you know the ERB universe is just mm -hmm. much fun for words. Exactly, um, and that, that's 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 the key to it is no is knowing what to look for. I could easily have missed something that you know on these on any of these chapters, the chapters mm -hmm. here I've already covered, or chapters that you all be talking about. I could have easily yeah. missed. There's so yeah. much. Oh, I I also think it's interesting that they do reference one of the stories from the Worlds of Edgar Rice Burroughs, which is like short stories by different authors, right? Um, as having taken place in the official Edgar Rice Burroughs universe. You know, and I guess we don't know if the if the entire if the story uh, as a whole is considered canon or if just the end result of it is considered canon. But um, it was kind of interesting that they were reaching beyond the new books that they're commissioning to other right. by other authors, and at the uh, at the very least, cherry picking some of them to fit into this universe. And that's a very good point. In fact, and to, to your to, to to your note. My understanding, and what I say here is not official by any means, so this is my recollection, which is not trustworthy. Mm -hmm. My recollection is that the events that are referenced specifically by a canonized book, which is Tarzan Battle of Pulitzer, the events mm -hmm. that it references become a part of ERB canon. Not the entire short story, only the events that it references. Okay. So whatever they said about that story uh, going to uh, land of the time for God, for example, the 0220 having crashed there, uh, Heinz and Zupner being involved in it, those kinds of things that they might have said in this book are, are considered part of canon, okay. but not the entire short story. Um, that That's my understanding of it, to put it okay. that. Well, that makes sense. That makes sense. Right. Any other thoughts or comments? Nope, I'm okay. All right. Well, I'm being long-winded as usual. I got another chapter or two here to go. Uh, chapter six, North by 0220. It's got a Hitchcock sound to it. North by 0220. We are still in Suzanne's flashback, by the way. Uh, this chapter opens with Janice saying, I'm heartsick for Calluster. Now, she's still continuing this discussion she had with Jason earlier, and she, she's not going to let go of this. He just might as well give up. After a spirited discussion, Janet tells Jason point blank, they're moving to Pelluster, end of topic, period. Another thing that I thought was a little humorous, uh, true to life. Uh, one ben benefit of them going and living in Pelluster is that their son Jansen was study with Abner Perry because it is not common knowledge among this group that the young Victory Harbin has really benefited from being a student of Abner Perry. They learned a great deal of things and they're hoping Jansen can, be, um, can also pick up the same, same level of teaching. So the, the Gridleys decide that they're going to move to Pelluster. They make arrangements for um, uh, Heinz's wife. I think, what did I say? He is a navigator. 
uh, on the 0220. Uh, his wife, Anna, will take over Jason Gridley's house, move in there, maintain the house so they're not going to give up the house. But she'll maintain it. And, um, and she'll also monitor the communications while they're on this expedition. So she, if they needed to reach out to the uh, uh, military, they would be a, be a Gridley wave would contact Anna, and then she would have some kind of uh, contact to get help from the military if that were necessary. Um, Jane and Tarzan and Korok have a brief phone conversation to update each other. So we, we, we see here that Jane is still alive and kicking, and Korok's alive and kicking. They take taking care of business back home. Suzanne uh, is on that same phone call and speaks with her mom, Miriam, and uh, her mom tells her to be careful. But of course, uh, Suzanne's a chip off the old block, so uh, she's going to do what she needs to do. Now, everyone boards the 0220 for this trip, including Erhard Dreschler. There is a reference of Nazi expeditions direct. Oh, there's, there's a mention of Nazi expeditions directed by Himmler to seek occult artifacts. They believe the city of Ultima Thule contains ar archaeological artifacts of immense power and ability. Now, Drexler may have defected, and this is something I mentioned earlier, he may have defected, but he still speaks highly of the Nazi movement. He says, and this is a direct quote, this is on page 67 of the soft cover edition, so it's in the hardcover somewhere. I think it's towards the end of chapter six. He says, you will all shake and tremble in fear like Gideon's army of Herod you cannot stop the new world order. So I still don't know why he defected. He's still talking up, still talking <laughs> about it. But uh, that was his parting comment there at the end of chapter six. Any thoughts or anything from you all? Um, yeah, I think we're getting some foreshadowing here about, or just some pretty solid indications of that, you know, Dreschler might have been defecting, but, um, you know, we know he didn't defect because of a moral reasons. He defected because the other Nazis were going to kill him. And we mm -hmm. just see here that he is still a jerk. He's still a bigot and a, um, uh, and a hardcore Nazi, even, <clears> if, <throat> even if he is, seems to be on the outs with the Nazi government right now. Mm -hmm. And that, that's important for later on. It explains his actions for later on. So there's some, some effective uh, uh, character foreshadowing here. Very good. Very good. Moving now into Chapter 7, the polar opening. Uh, Jason and Janice struggle with how to answer Jansen's questions about Pallister and the danger the Mayhars pose. Well, they they finally decide just to tell the boy the truth that yes, Mayhars will eat people. That is true. Uh, this gives the author a chance to recap the the Mayhars for the reader to to inform the reader of some more about the Mayhars. So they discuss that the Mayhars eat people, that the Mayhars have strong mental powers, have no ears, and communicate via some strange sixth sense that only Abner Perry can, can explain, and that Mayhars are only female. Uh, they also note some of the history of David Ennis led an army against the Mayhars and taught the Mayhars that humans are intelligent, because prior to that, as I said, the Mayhars looked down their noses, long noses, at, at the humans. Now, this chapter, in addition to background information, this chapter has some very picturesque scenes that, again, I think would be well suited for, for a movie. As they near the polar opening at the North Pole, it is known the time dilation that occurs. Time dilation being a phenomenon due to the relative motion differences acceleration, where time seems to move at different speeds. Really plays havoc with your Timex watch. John Cameron Sweezy, wherever you are. They begin <laughs> to they begin to pick up signals from the grid as they get into this the polar opening. They begin to pick up signals from the gridly wave navigation beacons. And, and the description that as they enter the polar opening is very vivid and will look great on film, as I noted earlier. Suzanne goes up to the observation deck to watch the phenomenon. They see a rare purple and blue undulating light. And that's, that's uh, Win Scott Eckert's word, undulating. I don't use that word very often, but I'm sure it fits. Uh, Suzanne felt this was akin to the Aurora Borealis. And Jansen got this a sign of change in time. So Jansen got to stay up and watch because his mom was going to put him to bed and his dad says, let the boy stay up. He may only get this opportunity once. So, so we get a glimpse of family life here in a, in a Tarzan novel, which is kind of a rare thing. That concludes my comments. Chapter seven, polar opening. Any, anything from you all? Um, yeah, I just want to say that, like, as we've seen Jana in the last few chapters, in when we meet here, her in Tarzan and at the Earth's core, she's very strong-willed there, as we see her here. So Eckert's doing a great job of recapturing the personality, the character of 
actually is one of my favorite Burroughs women because she's a lot of fun in Tarzan at the Earth's Core. And we get a sense of why she was so much fun here, even though she's more of a minor character in this book. Um, we still get a sense of just how, how fun a character she is. Indeed. Um, all right, if, if nothing else, let me go on and get into this chapter eight. Uh, mm -hmm. That's entitled Scouting by Auto Gyro. Now this is, this is the last uh, chapter, I believe, for um, oh, uh, Suzanne's uh, flashback. Yes, it is. Okay, good. So once inside, so we're in chapter eight, Scouting by Auto Gyro. Once inside the polar opening, Jason Gridley mentions a crashed tight air balloon that David Ennis found some 17 years ago. This event was mentioned in Tanner of Pluster. It's in Tanner of Pluster, chapter 15, entitled Madness. This tells, this tells us that this story, Tarzan Battle for Pluster, takes place about 17 years after the events of Tanner of Pluster. Now, this is useful if we are building, talking about uh, fandom. This is useful if we are building or adding to a timeline for events in Pluster. Now, just like canon and Easter eggs, the timeline and chronology is something else that I enjoy a great deal. So this is valuable information to me because I'm trying to figure out where all these things occur. As we discussed earlier, getting it specifically from the author, what time frame the Tarzan Bell Pluster occurs in, which I think you said there was in 1943. Uh, yes, yeah, that late, September, late. December 1943. Yes, uh, before the events of Tarzan and Foreign Legion. That's valuable information to me, as is this. Here, uh, the author is telling us that Tanner Pluster, uh, I beg your pardon, that the events that we see here occur some 17 years after Tanner Pluster's uh, discovery of that, uh, of that uh, hot air balloon. So that's the value there. Uh, they also further describe the navigational beacons that use the Gridley Wave technology and successfully receive navigational pings. I've touched on that. Uh, and I also, they also talk about taking precautions to not get lost uh, using those navigational means and other means of staying in touch and knowing where you are and how to get back to where you need to get back to, be it the airship or someplace. Uh, and, and note that Tarzan spent most of, the, of his event, prior adventure trying to find his way back home. So this book reminds the native Pelucidarians, oh, this, this reminds us of the native Pelucidarians' homing instinct. Uh, Jason also mentions there's a project underway to map Pelucidar. They don't give any details of how that's being done or where, where they are, but they say that they are developing a map of Pelucidar. Jason reminds us that initially David and Abner intended to modernize and industrialize Pelucidar, and that's stated towards the end of, I believe, uh, towards the end of one of the first two Pelucidor books. Yeah, I think towards, it's towards the, the end of Pelucidor after they finally the have one. a stable empire. Right, they they're really talking about printing presses and, and weapons mm -hmm. and flying machines and, and all kinds of things. But they backed off on that, on that idea. They, they discovered that once they had the uh, Mayhar menace reduced, that um, there was a lack of interest by the Pelucidarians in doing any more than just their normal day-to-day -day life. So Ennis did organize that Federated Army but otherwise, life has remained simple in Pluster. Now, they get a phone call, or oh, a Gridley Wave, I beg your pardon. They get a Gridley Wave call from Diane the Beautiful. They've just arrived in Pluster, just come through the Aurora Borealis thing. Uh, and um, Diane the Beautiful, that's David Ennis's wife, calls via Gridley Wave to say that David is on the march with some of his troops uh, north to confront the Nazi invaders. So these people here on the 0220 need to be on lookout with them so they can link up and coordinate activities. Uh, the other reason that Diane calls is to say that Victory Harbin is missing. Uh, Jason and the crew promise to watch for Victory and if necessary, will search for her once the primary mission is complete. Now think about Victory Harbin, an intelligent young lady. She's growing up in Pluster, knows her way around, very comfortable there. It's normal to her, even though there's animals wanting to eat you and cavemen with clubs pound you over the head and that sort of thing. Um, she's very comfortable there and knows her way around and could take care of herself. A little naive, perhaps, maybe. We decide here as we get to know her. Um, but uh, she's, uh, she's missing. So most likely she's trying to, to join this expedition, most likely. So they'll keep an eye out for her. Meanwhile, remember we talked about Harbor Knight and how resilient and how tough it is? The, the hull of the 0220 is being bombarded by untamed thiptars. These are pterodactyls or re winged reptiles that are just banging into the side of the 0220. They don't know what it is. 
they probably view it as a menace or a threat to them. So they're they're giving their all running into the thing, which is probably very rough on them health wise. And the disorganizing effect of Flusker is noted. Uh, that disorganizing effect kind of uh, I'm looking for the right word kind of instills a, um, a lack of ur yeah, a lack of urgency, a lack of urgency. So they're having troubles with the crew. It's not serious, but they're having troubles with the crew of being at workstations on time or getting things done on time because because time is such a foreign concept in Flusster, there's no urgency for the residents there to do anything in a hurry. They'll get to it when they get to it. And it's more than just it's more than just uh, the residents. But anyone coming into Plooster experiences this also. So they're having to stay on top of, uh, of the things that need to be done in a certain time frame. When you're running a ship like the O220, a massive engineering feat like that, then you've got to watch things like temperature gauges and such and, and, and check them periodically. So there's this organizing effect of Plooster is noted, and that gets mentioned several times in this book. Now, to expand their coverage and to search for David Ennis's army, Suzanne begins taking out daily trips, daily reconnaissance uh, in the auto gyro. This is a flying machine, a little bit like a helicopter. And these things did exist in the 1940s. I checked that. But on one such trip, she is attacked by Thipdars who seem intent on making her crash. Now, who told the Thipdars to do this? Well, first thing that comes to my mind are these Mayhars with their hypnotic control. But we don't get told that just as Suzanne has the impression that Thipdars are doing this on purpose that they're being directed. So she, her... Auto gyro is attacked by Thipdars and she is in danger of crashing. She escapes by parachute from the damaged auto gyro, but then she's still further attacked by the Thipdars. And, and uh, this might explain some of her injuries that we discussed when we first met her over in that uh, cavern. So she's attacked by a Thipdar, she parachutes, she's still being attacked by a Thipdar, she shoots the thing with her pistol. And the parachute, because she was close to the ground, opened up, did not open up properly. So she plumped it and crash landed into the branches of a tree. And there in that tree, she lost consciousness. So that completes her flashback and takes us up to the point where she opens, uh, where she awakens inside the cavern in Blooster. Someone has found her in that tree and hauled her down to this cavern where she is being uh, fed and, and, and nurtured uh, for a dinner by the Gorbises. So that completes your flashback, and that completes everything I have to say up to chapter eight. Any comments or questions from you all? Um, yeah, I wanted to add that the Thiptars that attacked them were were being flown by human beings. Um, so it wasn't just pterodactyls. It was um, um, what's going to turn out to be uh, Lordon, the guy she's she is forced to team up with to get to escape the Gorbises, was flying the uh, the beast that she killed. So. Um, that's one reason he's so antagonistic to her uh, initially.